So welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar opening forest data from promises to practice. My name is Riikka Paloniemi and I'm coming from Finnish Ilmati Institute Syke here in Finland. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to this event. We have been organizing this webinar with our colleagues from Syke here in Finland and uh, those from the University of Alberta there in Canada. During the next hour, we'll conclude the results from our research project called Governing Digital Commons. The project was funded by the Academy of Finland during the last four years, and it explored the governance frameworks for the opening and sharing of natural research knowledge. We have been asking questions like, have the promises related to open forest data be been fulfilled? Have the expected benefits been graded? Are the rules clear for everyone? And can opening data lead to new innovations and better governance? Today, we'll shortly describe our findings and we'll begin with short presentations given by senior researcher Anu Lähtemäki Uutala, her developed manager Salla Rantala, and researcher Heidi Lehtiniemi all from Inward Policy Center here in Syke. Anu is Inward a lawyer, Salla is expert in common studies and Heidi made her master thesis about useful knowledge uh, for the University of Helsinki in the project. After these presentations, we'll continue with short commentaries given by Professor Gordon Gov. Uh, professor of Communication at the University of Alberta, and Professor Teppo Huyala, Professor of Bi Forest Bioeconomic Foresight at the Uni University of Eastern Finland. And after these commentaries, we'll get closing remarks with the title Global Perspective on Governing Digital Commons, given by Brent Swallow, Professor, professor of Agricultural and Innovative Economics from the University of Alberta. During the webinar, there are also opportunities for you to ask questions and give comments. They are much valued. Uh, please write down, down them in the chat. And our trainee, Terry Arola, will follow the chat and share your questions and comments for the speakers to allow us to lead the webinar smoothly. Thank you again for coming to the webinar. And let's move next to this interesting topic by hearing Anu's presentations. Anu, please, floor is yours. Thank you, Rika. So uh, my topic is forest data and legal rights to forests. So how is uh, data about forests and rights to forest natural resources and forest ecosystem services. So how these are connected? Because uh, people are uh, and actors are interested in data because they are interested in forests. Uh, some of the benefits, uh, 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 potential benefits and promises of increased access to forest data we've categorized into four in uh, this project. Uh, related those benefits related to ecological functions, to products, uh, to experiences, and to democracy. So uh, it's assumed and um, uh, hoped that uh, increased access to data can lead to better, better environment, better biodiversity, better carbon sinks, uh, better products in the bioeconomy, and better experiences and uh, enhanced, enhanced tourism sector. So this would be also macroeconomic benefits. Uh, related to growth and jobs, if we get uh, better products and uh, more products and more more experiences and better experiences. And then all this transparency is also good for democracy. So uh, citizens can decide based on knowledge and uh, decision making can be improved. And um, next slide, please. Uh, legal rights to forests are related to many different benefits of forests. And uh, biodiversity uh, is one, one key benefit and uh, the ecosystem services provided by the trees and the plants and, and the water. Then, then we have berries and mushrooms and all other non-timber forest, forest products. 
And of course, timber is the most important economic sector in both Finland and, and in Canada, uh, if we think about forest, forest products. Tourism is also very important in both countries and uh, forest experiences and the benefits of forest experience to human health, both physical and mental health are significant. Uh, what, uh, what forest data can do related to uh, legal rights? The access to data can strengthen legal rights to forest ecosystem services. Uh, environmental rights, it can strengthen the rights if everybody knows where, where the biodiversity hotspots and the old forest and the uh, endangered species are located. So this can strengthen this uh, environmental rights and nature protection law, the compliance of nature protection law. Then it can also spark renegotiation of rights when all new actors come to forest and want to benefit from them and get more data about the forests and what's in them. Uh, it may um, uh, bring uh, to society the need to re renegotiate over what, what can be done with the forests and who can use them and who can visit them. And a clarification of existing rights may be needed. Uh, for example, in Finland, uh, Every man's rights are important, uh, legal rights based on customary law, and uh, it may, may uh, data about uh, different uh, things in forests, products and services that are possible, may uh, bring the need to clarify how much people can go and how, how close to residential buildings and uh, things like this. Also, it's possible that um, data can act and has acted as a foundation and basis for ecosystem service markets. So not only we can legally regulate uh, who, who can go to forest, but we can, or who can use the forest resources, but we can uh, negotiate and contract over them in, uh, in the markets and trade, uh, create uh, places to trade uh, rights, to, rights to benefit from uh, forests. And uh, uh, some quotes from our interviews too. Two first one are, landowner interviews from Finland and this these show two examples of how increased access to data can create or bring bring forward the controversy between different rights related to forests first first one is about the nature protection and property rights so property owners may see it as a threat if nature protectors come and they know all about the, everything that's in the forest so they may demand more to be protected so this can be a dynamic impact of, of access to data. Another one is uh, related to every man's rights. A similar, similar issue, like more, the more uh, people know, the more, the more people can come to use, use those every man's rights and then landowner can see this as a, as a threat. Uh, one third quote is from uh, tourism company interviews. They, they discussed whether um, tourism companies can be uh, interested in logging plans uh, because it uh, impacts landscape and route planning, but they can really not impact that much uh, to uh, don't don't have an impact uh, on on loggings if they just uh, express their opinion. So because the landowner is the one who decides on loggings anyway. So for this purpose, uh, like in Kusamo, they have created the ecosystem service markets, like a landscape compensation systems. So uh, legal rights and markets are two alternative ways of then resolving these uh, conflicts between uh, landowners and other users of forests. And last slide, conclusions uh, from the legal rights perspective. Uh, the main, main conclusion is that the increased access to forest data as such does not uh, give the citizens rights to enjoy forest ecosystem services nor the companies, but they have to be agreed in uh, the legal rights regime and in, in the markets. But uh, digital forest platforms are a good place to combine all this data and uh, democratic participation between citizen and government and also markets and arenas for trade in forest ecosystem services. Like you can buy a fishing license or a license to go with the snowmobile from the same place where you can see good, good spots for this, uh, this activity. So data and governance and democracy and trade all, all can be combined in new digital platforms uh, of forests. 
So that's uh, my main, main, main conclusions. Uh, next, uh, Salah's turn. Thank you, Arno. Good. Uh, so I'll talk about another aspect of our study, which is how the rules of the game for governing forest data are shaped by the forest governance context and vice versa, based on case studies in Finland and in Canada. Um, Anu also mentioned forest governance, uh, but what do we mean by it? Or what do we mean, we mean by data governance? So two concepts are key. Institutions, which are the rules of the game, including legal frameworks, contracts and social norms, etc., as well as actors as humans uh, who create institutions and whose actions are guided by them. And um, as, as Anu explained, when data is understood as means to capture the diverse values of uh, uh, at the actual resources, such as forest, we can expect that the actors interested in creating rules for forest data are at least partially the same as those involved in forest governance. So governance is, is understood as uh, the dynamic interplay of actors and institutions uh, shaping the rules for forest data with feedback loops back to the forest governance. Uh, other uh, factors that we have paid attention to in our analysis include, for example, discourses, meaning the language and action through which uh, certain ideas such as open data or bioeconomy or bio biodiversity conservation are enacted, uh, as well as technologies that enable actors to access data. Uh, so in the case of Finland, uh, we studied the process of opening forest data <clears throat> by focusing on the renewal uh, of the uh, Forest Information Act, uh, which concerns data on private forests, uh, which is the largest forest tenure category in, in Finland. And this process involved an important shift, if you look at the actors, um, in the actor coalitions previously identified in Finnish forest governance, with most actors in favor of fully open forest data, with the expectation of the kind of benefits that Anu just described, um, and only really the forest owners were concerned with privacy is issues. But we could say that the determining factor in this case for opening the data were actually requirements by higher level institutions, particularly the EU directive of public environmental information uh, that the Forest Information Act had to align with. So institutions at different levels of governance also play an important role for data governance. Uh, and in that regard, Canada is a very different case. Uh, and uh, my Canadian colleagues can uh, correct me and, and compliment me. But I've understood that most forests are public and their governance is divided between federal and subnational, provincial and territorial governments, uh, altogether 14 of them. And an important feature of forest governments are, are public-private partnerships uh, in which these different governments delegate forest management responsibilities uh, and, and rights as well to private forest companies. Um, and forest data management is likewise fragmented. There's no overarching national legislation to govern, uh, it, but the key institutions are data sharing agreements between the various actors. Now, this could mean that there could be more tailored solutions to govern forest data that account for diverse economic, environmental and indigenous interests in a context specific way. But it can also mean that uh, there's a risk that the outcomes repeatedly reflect the interests of actors already advantaged by the forest governance context. So in a way, we could say that the path dependence of forest governance extends to forest data governance. Uh, so to conclude, um, these case studies have uh, shown us uh, that the forest data governance is very much shaped by dynamics or status or durability in forest governance and vice versa. So it could uh, support forest data institutions that actually conform with the existing path dependent forest governance 
or data institutions that support renewal and, and transitions in forest governance, as, as hopefully in the case of Finland, which still very much remains to be seen. So thank you very much. And uh, I will um, give the floor to Anu, uh, to Heidi. Thank you. Thanks, Salla. So yeah, um, my name is Heidi Lehtiniemi, and I would like to say a few words about the difference between accessible and usable forest data. So um, let's think about the concept of open forest data. Uh, the first question I would like you to consider is who is it open to? Uh, because different users have different needs. For example, officials typically need their data in a more applied form, whereas researchers prefer raw data and then it's citizens typically enjoy visual and often simplified presentations. In order to provide for these three user groups, and there are more, um, you already have to offer at least three different forms of data. And when we're talking about opening forest data, typically only one form of data is published. And maintaining the databases and platforms requires resources. This sets limits on the quantity and diversity of the data available. Prioritizing the needs of some users is necessary, but simultaneously it means excluding others. And then when we consider the traditional meaning of accessibility, uh, referring to the presentation that takes into consideration, for example, size limitations, uh, which is very relevant in this context too, uh, how can the data be truly accessible if it's presented in only one way? And therefore, I would argue that even if data is public, it is not accessible for everybody since there are so many different needs involved. And this also applies to open forest data. And then the second question I would like you to consider is does access to data make it used? And this, in my opinion, seems like an optimistic expectation given how many traditions and theories there are on ensuring societal use of science, for example. And one relevant comparison here are models, since models aim to provide data in an easily understandable form, and still even them struggle with being usable. And based on our literature analysis, uh, in addition for technical features, such as successful framing and proper scale, the interaction between users and modelers is essential when bringing science into practice. So to conclude, one size doesn't fit all. And this combined with the absence of interaction can at least partially explain why the expected promises have yet to be fulfilled, not entirely, but some of them. And um, I don't want to end with such a negative comment, so I would like to present you with a few concrete examples of forest data being used. And the first one is Lai.fi, uh, which is operated by the Finnish Natural History Museum. And it can be considered as a Finnish pioneer since it started to operate in 2015. Lai.fi is a data warehouse providing information on species targeting uh, regular citizens, officials, and researchers. They have access to government organizations, their own databases, but also have a citizen science site. And our second example is the uh, Finnish Forest Center's Metsan.fi platform that provides forest owners information and recommendations on how to manage their forests. The data is usually represented in a GIS form and everything is available online. So no downloading or separate programs are needed. Uh, then an example from, from a forestry company called Suraensa. Uh, they have this app called Virtual Forest, and it visualizes the effects of forestry, for example, cutting. So as a forest owner, you can test different scenarios and see how the forest will look like after, after them. And then one example about uh, non-timber forest products, so the Finnish Natural Resources Institute, Luke, has this um, site for information on the regional yield of three different berries. And then last but not least, we have the Finnish Ecosystem Observatory that aims to collect information regarding the state of nature from various sources. And since it's an ongoing project, no platform is yet published, but it's an interesting example, and I would recommend you keep an eye out for that. And that's all from my side. Thank you.
thank you very much. And we actually have a question in the chat. Uh, it says, how far does the open data initiative also cover private slash operational costs and commercial margins, aka private benefits? And asking from a perspective of public or private costs and benefits. Who wants to answer? Yes, I'll go ahead. I can give it a go, and and but I would then also like to give the floor to Brent, who is a, really an expert on this topic. Um, uh, so I'm not sure what you refer to by open data initiative. I guess there are several several initiatives or, or sort of um, yeah uh, it, it, trends associated with the, with the, with open data in in different countries. Um, but um, I guess um, the it's part of the rationale for opening the data that it will also create private benefits, and uh, and that private uh, actors also then assimilate the costs of of producing those benefits. Um, so I, I guess that would be just my my very very short short answer. But I, I I'd like to give it a go thanks uh, so i can sell i i wonder if the questioner is asking specifically about the finland case though so in the maybe you can just respond to that before i say anything or maybe after i say something um so maybe you can just say specifically with the recent opening in finland uh, how how broad did that reach um just to i guess a more global perspective on this is uh uh, we have yet to see, uh, or yet, yet to see documented a kind of wide variety of sharing mechanisms for forest data in North America, but we have seen it in the agriculture sector. So the agriculture sector is probably uh, the place, the agriculture and health sectors are probably We'll see them uh, and private partnerships, whether they be public public partnerships, which is kind of the norm now, um, or whether they be private private partnerships and, and different platforms. So there's going to need to be quite an array, uh, and I'll touch upon this a little bit at the end as well. Over to you, Sala. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, um, I, I don't know if it was at your end or my end, but you were breaking off a little bit, so I didn't hear everything, didn't get everything you said, but maybe just, uh, I think in the, in the Finnish case, I could just repeat uh, what I said, that, that, that part, of, part of the rationale for opening the, the forest data was very much the creation of, of private benefits, as well as this sort of the um, uh, shifting of part of the costs of, of producing those benefits to, to the private sector. But of course, part of the solution is that the, it's, it's the, the, the costs are still very much subsidized by the, stent, uh, by the state through the, the production of the data, which is it's, it, it's, it very much relates also to the Finnish forestry history that, that um, uh, data on private forest resources uh, are produced with uh, with public money and through public organizations. Thank you so much for that. And we seem to have another question as well. Um, so uh, what is your opinion on availability of national forest inventory data? And national data of forest is increasingly under pressure and scrutiny because of carbon trading and other environmental policies that take these big figures into account. Um, so yeah, that's quite of a long question, but if that was enough to get started and read from the chat, so do you have any thoughts on that? Salah or Brent or? Uh, I, I wonder if we can just get a bit of clarification about the question. Is that is that directed to the Finnish case or the Canada case or 
something or more generally. Peter, do you want to continue explaining your question? I, I believe that it's recording. It's focusing on Finnish forest inventory. Specifically, yes. but do, did you have something specific in mind that you would like to explain for us? If I uh, if I may add orally, then I know that uh, Finland and Canada are, have different uh, takes on this uh, question. Uh, that Canada, for example, uh, ac um, allows limited access to its uh, forestry inventory, but uh, I I'm, I think Finland does not. Um, and uh, the question is very, let's say, intense in Estonia, where there is very low trust towards um, uh, national inventory data by some scientists. And so the um, the the question, how was it measured, is is sort of in the in the limelight. And uh, in in the, in the general science, there has been arguments that all forestry data should be made available. But if you make the a grid available, then the whole inventory and the, the it would just be less re reliable if this goes public. So I was just wondering if if you have a general comment on this or if you know any national discussions. Thank you. I'll, I guess I'll just try on that from the Canadian perspective. Uh, you're right that the, you know, we have 14 different agencies who have responsibility for the kind of ownership and management of forest, of the public forest resources, which is 92% of all forest resources. And it, they have, uh, there's some kind of overall uh, minimum standards for uh, that they have agreed upon among the 14 agencies. But when you look at the uh, at the data, there's huge differences in resolution and the amount of data which are publicly available through those different agencies. So uh, that it does make it things like ecosystem service markets are are difficult uh, when we don't have uh, you know great data across the country. There tends, there has been some advantages of experimentation in different jurisdictions that that kind of allows. Uh, so there are instances where uh, provincial governments and First Nations, Indigenous peoples, as well as private companies, have come together to make sure that there is very there is higher quality data for management of particular areas, and that has facilitated ecosystem service markets in those particular areas. But that is then not easily transferable to new new places. Thank you, Brent. And yes, better said that thank you as well. Great. We can continue that if needed later. Are there any other questions or? Shall we shall we take now Gordon's and Teppo's commentaries uh, yeah, and then we can continue after those a little bit more. Gordon, please. OK, thank you for the opportunity to to comment uh, on the project. Um, uh, I don't work directly in forestry. Uh, I do work in uh, development and agriculture, so uh, and a lot of the work I do is touches on these issues, um, uh, as well as I have a long-standing interest in uh, data commons and, and open data movements. So um, I guess my comments um, in, in thinking about the project and the findings um, build on some remarks that were just exchanged. Um, the long-term <clears throat> impact of this is going to be significant uh, in terms of path dependency, and I like this relationship between forest governance and and the governance of data uh, around forests. Uh, that relationship that was brought out uh, in, in the project is really important. Um, and this idea that they're sort of codependent, right? That changes in one will affect changes in the other. Um, and what I was thinking about, you know, the long term impact, a lot of this data will be the big data movement. So the at the collection of large amounts of data or the 
uh, let's say the impulse or the, the initiatives that are uh, looking to collect large amounts of data and combine it with other forms of data for environmental and other uh, purposes uh, is going to be obviously a significant concern going forward. And we know uh, particularly when we're thinking about artificial intelligence and machine learning context that the quality of data is going to be really important in terms of addressing uh, potential systemic biases and other problems that um, that will surface uh, down the road and they will be difficult problems to get ourselves out of uh, if we're if um, if we don't think well ahead uh, in terms of the the quality of the data that's being that these machines uh, machine learning systems and AI systems are being trained on uh, so I think that to me really draws out the importance of this idea of capabilities uh, and the 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 varying levels of capabilities between different stakeholders, not only in engaging in the discussions, but also in uh, collecting and stewarding of data uh, that's going to be going into these systems. And um, thinking about the importance of maybe something like a data stewardship regime that not only involves uh, sector specific actors in forestry, but may also require contributions and uh, coalitions, collaborations across sectors, given that a lot of this data will be mashed up uh, in the efforts to build AI and machine learning systems going forward. Um, so I think the work's really important drawing out that uh, uh, those questions. And I guess I would leave it my comments with a question, which is around uh, stewardship models that extend beyond forestry, but are com uh, to cross sector uh, arrangements. Um, so forestry and water, for instance, forestry and environment and so on. Um, is there, are there any models for these kind of cross sectoral uh, collaborations that the project is able to look to as potentially um, future um, uh, initiatives or future questions that may affect policy in this area? Thank you. Really interesting comments. I, I, I liked it a lot. Let's let's answer to it after Teppo's comments, of course, then we can combine these, these two commentaries together. Uh, Teppo, please continue here. Thank you and, and greetings uh, to all uh, old and new friends and also those who uh, possibly are watching and listening to this uh, recording afterwards. Uh, let me use a few seconds to share one slide that I have prepared for you to support my commentary. Sorry. It comes here. Perfect. Um, there we go. So what I have for you are these viewpoints. Uh, I consider that uh, the project has uh, quite nicely uh, identified uh, this movement or our set of initiatives around uh, openness, uh, open data. And when we look at that from, uh, from the perspective of uh, science policy practice interface, we notice that there are kind of instances of this uh, openness movement in each of the components of, of this triangle if you may. So in, in the science, in scientific research, we have, uh, we have open data, open access, uh, transparency of, of uh, methodologies and, and so forth. Uh, and then we have in the policy uh, part, we also have these uh, initiatives to, uh, through uh, political decisions and then policy programs, uh, to contribute to opening these uh, data resources uh, with the motivation of, uh, of uh, impacting uh, the market, uh, for example. And uh, in the practice, we also see that there, there we have a phenomena uh, such as uh, 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 open innovation. Uh, we have the phenomenon of uh, open foresight. If I take an example of my own field of applied uh, futures research, all these uh, openness movement uh, components are somehow connected to each other. 
And then when we look at close, when we look uh, closer at the uh, forestry uh, policy part, uh, I notice, uh, which I think your uh, project also uh, quite convincing, convincingly noticed that uh, the uh, kind of a grand motivation or one of the main points there is to support uh, market innovation and and uh, the transformation to uh, new forms of economy and to enable new actors to take their positions uh, and uh, create new services that uh, then would uh, bring benefits uh, widely to society. Now, uh, one may easily ask, uh, does this really happen? Has it, uh, has it taken place? Uh, has it taken place in Canada? Has it taken place in Finland or in other countries in, in Europe, for example? Uh, it is an important question that uh, the impacts uh, that we have seen, uh, you, you may recognize some, some nice examples of progress uh, through technological developments, and, and we probably will be seeing those uh, with the development of AI systems and so on. Uh, but still, uh, you may critically ask, uh, okay, are these developments with this time frame are they uh, slow or quick or what uh, what did we expect and and is this a kind of a, a great success beyond our expectations or is this kind of a partial failure that's something that i would i would welcome research on in, in near future then my viewpoint is uh, uh, to address this uh, uh, concept of digital commons a uh, very important one, and uh, since this is your kind of a more or less starting point uh, in the title of the pro project, I noticed that you also have dealt with the, uh, with the issue of uh, public versus private goods. But indeed, I, I'm, I'm viewing this so that uh, these kind of a uh, digital commons can be seen uh, as kind of a public goods and also as vehicles for promoting public goods, which also can lead further further to businesses and, and private goods. Uh, so the question remains, however, uh, what kind of power issues there are. There certainly are power issues, not only those that are connected to the private landowners' concerns on data privacy, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, with this uh, openness movement, we also have the, the data protection regulation, we have the accessibility uh, regulation and the uh, and the uh, the great achievements and, and progresses on, on those aspects, which uh, enables wider uh, access and hopefully in future wider usability uh, with the data. But still, uh, there are questions. Uh, how are the, the benefits distributed? How are they redistributed? How are the roles uh, renegotiated? There still are power issues that uh, probably uh, requires some uh, public dialogue uh, to resolve the, the remaining tensions. And I think there is uh, quite a lot of research to be done with those. Uh, for example, taking a closer look at the, the discourses around uh, open data and, and, and the practices uh, connected to these discourses, so that these kind of uh, aspects uh, and issues related to the to the privacy and to the uh, lack of uh, or the weakness of impacts with the uh, with the uh, uh, new businesses perhaps and and uh, also the accessibility and usability of the data will be further investigated so uh, these were my viewpoints and i wish uh, to hear uh, some important and interesting questions from you thank you Uh, thank you, Gordon and Teppo. Really, really good comments. And would you, who would like like to start commenting these comments, or is there some reflections that you would like to share about maybe Gordon Stewart, Stewart's models or openness movements? They were the keys. Yes, Allah, please. Good. Okay, thanks. Um, I, yeah, I'm I'm thrilled to get to address your very very intriguing and 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 good comments. Um, uh, actually, 
from from Gordon's comments, my <laughs> my on top of my head, I have this idea uh, to um, to look at these sort of cross sectoral collaborations on, for for open data, for example, on forest data uh, and water data, uh, which is something that we at Suke are, are of course at, at very in a very good position to do. Actually, uh, Suke is also a, a pioneer in 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 the area of, of water water data. So so an excellent idea. Um, thank you for that. Of course, of course, welcome welcome anyone else to uh, take that up as well. Um, uh, Teppo's comments, wow, uh, so many, I, I don't know where to start. Um, yeah, maybe to start with the, with the impacts of, uh, of, uh, of innovation, uh, of open data and, and, and the in innovation potential, whether it's been realized and at, and at which time scales we should be seeing these these uh, innovations materialize and, and and it's a good case because uh, it's a good, it's a good point because during the project what we sort of kept hearing were the expectations and and we didn't uh, i have to say that we didn't systematically uh, look at every possible route to 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 dig up the the uh, the new innovations but uh, it, it's still Kind of the feeling that we were left off is that there's still these expectations sort of prevail rather than the the, the actual uh, materialized innovations and 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 I suspect that a, that a big big um, uh, factor in that is that when when data is is being produced, it's usually produced for a specific purpose. And and as as Heidi also addressed in in her commentary, it's it, 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 it takes quite a bit of massaging to, to make it work for, for other purposes. So, so just maybe uh, shortly on that. Then the digital commons point. Um, so yeah, digital com common, the commons aspect didn't, didn't drop, uh, went drop off during the project. Actually, what we would conceive is rather a, like a continuum Kind of like you described, Seppo, uh, Seppo from from uh, fully fully private to, to to common or or shared or, and to to public or open data. And um, I just uh, attended um, a, a, a conference on on knowledge commons uh, in the beginning of of um, uh, June. It was this year, and uh, it, it kind of seems that that commons now encompasses quite a bit so anything to do with data sharing is common so so we shouldn't be too worried about um, the shying away from the concept as well and 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 then the power issues and and the discourses those were a very central feature of an, our analysis because obviously that the, the actors exert the powers that they have when uh, institutions are are created, so that they would resemble their own interests. So um, yeah, that's that's that that's a very very uh, important aspect and uh, something that we we did look at. But uh, obviously, uh, a lot of work can can still go into that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sarlan. And would, is there anybody else who would like to continue from those paths that Sala started or what Teppo and Gordon raised here? Is there something to add regarding the applications or legislation or Teppo, please? Uh, thank you, Rika. I actually have one uh, uh, additional point that I would like to make here. Uh, I have a vision. Uh, I, I won't say that I have a dream, but I have a vision that uh, there there could be a place for a, a, a shift uh, in the sense that uh, while in the in the past the power uh, was held by those actors who had the data stored, who could use them, so the data was power. But in in my vision, in this kind of a uh, digital commons world. Uh, I, I'm seeing it so that it could be that the power could be shifted from those who actually uh, store and, and uh, share the data to those who are able to utilize that open data more efficiently in collaboration with other actors. So that is, if that takes place, it's a huge uh, phenomenal 
and also a radical change in the way how value is created uh, through the use of environmental data. But uh, we are not there yet, but that really uh, kind of uh, makes me uh, think high when I'm thinking, OK, when this is the vision, how can we make sure that this is possible to achieve? Mm. Yeah, this is a fascinating idea. And I also agree that this, this vision could take place, but we still need capabilities, as Gordon mentioned in the beginning, and we should somehow feed in to current education processes or other ways to ensure that these, these capabilities are, are coming for, for the actors that can use the data and getting those innovations to materialize. Uh, that, that is something that we really need. Yes, Sala, please. Yeah, just to, just to say quickly that that's, that's actually exactly what I referred to when I concluded my presentation, that maybe we have these, these new forest data institutions that actually allow for renewal and, and transformations in, in forest governance. So, yeah, thanks. Good. Are there any questions to, to these points? You can write it in the chat or raise your hand because there's not so many persons here. It's possible to ask. If not, then I would like to allow Brent to give his... Oh, here is one. Maria Brockhaus writing here that this maybe their position is a bit overly optimistic. Okay. Data is not something independent. Yes, shall I yes, just? Please, Mark. Yeah. Sorry for. Um, first of all, thanks so much for for organizing this here. It's super interesting, and I just wanted to be a bit challenge. Challenge. I think we are, even though this whole event. I think you always point to power, to also politics, but data is of course not something independent. That then, if it is so, these these ideas of transparency as um, at, uh, to move forward towards more democracy is also very contested. Is that really working? And um, I think a lot has to do, and Teppo, as you were arguing, I thought this idea that then data is just in the hands of those that can do something new with it is, um, I would challenge that because I think data has been, before it is data, somebody in power has made decisions about what counts, what is counted, by whom it is counted, and to whom. And only then comes the moment of access and somebody else can do with it something with it. And I'm saying that also in populist time, where facts, as we all know, get constantly interpreted in very different ways, even though it might be the same paper or the, the same source. So I think we have to be very careful to believe that just data in itself in the hands of a wider mass can do. And I think you do that in the seminar. So I stop here, but I didn't, I wanted to point that out. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marie, for pointing this out. Uh, really important critics. Uh, Gordon, please, then we will let Brent to continue. I think yeah. it's something that he will probably touch in any case, but please Gordon. Sure, yeah, that, I think that was a really important comment, particularly on the epistemological, right, and political aspects of data. And on the one hand, you know, the risks of fetishizing data, right, giving it more power than it actually has, but on the other hand, underestimating the power that's inherent in the ability to collect, store, use, and share data. So always navigating that line. And this may be a good segue for Brent. Uh, in, in the Canadian context, we have obviously indigenous and first nations and the, and there is a looming issue around data sovereignty um, and control of data by those groups uh, and that um, you know that's an unresolved question and it's one that I think will be increasingly important not just in Canada but in other countries around the world and that also speaks to the epistemological question right so different epistemological uh, and worldviews from indigenous and first nations um, will come into uh, contact with notions around, um, you know, data science. So there's going to be some interesting research, I think, in examining that going forward. Yeah, 
exactly. Thank you. And now, Brent, please, please continue. Yeah. Okay, so I have the uh, I have the interesting topic of global perspectives on managing digital commons, which allows me to say anything because I'm I'm also last, so I can't be rebutted. Uh, so I'd like to just to three three points I'd like to make. One is uh, thank you so much for all of the contributions to this session, uh, and I think all of us in Finland and Canada are convinced of the importance of the work. Uh, we're working on still on manuscripts, uh, and in many ways we feel that we're we're really just touching the surface. And these issues are going to become increasingly important uh, in future years. And and even even just monitoring, you know, over what time and how does do the do the impacts of more open data uh, on 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 you know play themselves out in the finished cases? Very interesting question about that. So we're, we appreciate all this contribution and uh, we feel a little bit um, hard done by with this project as many other scientists over the last four years of, of having two of those years being pretty uh, limited by, the, by COVID. So we, we're, we, we feel that we've under delivered a little bit, but uh, I think there's been reasons for that. The, my global perspective comments uh, are about, relate to things that, that others have just raised in this question period. First is the uh, the importance of climate change. We that is a word, two words that haven't been put together in this session yet. But I think that we see, uh, you know, from uh, you know record temperature uh, uh, wildfires being uh, sparked off in places like Australia and uh, Western Canada and British Columbia and the United States this year, is that uh, climate change is disrupting the forest resources. Is disrupting forest mark forest products markets, is disrupting forest communities on a, on a new scale that we haven't seen before, which means that there's more uh, in, more need for high quality real time data, uh, and more power, uh, therefore, by those who hold that data and can apply that data. So there's a new climate change will put a whole new set of pressures on. Uh, on on the need for data and its application. Kind of related to that is that, uh, and as um, the last commenter just said, is that uh, data yields power uh, and open data can be a way to redress power imbalances. Uh, and we've seen examples of that in, in Brazil uh, and, and in Indonesia, for example, where more open data has helped to protect the rights of minority communities. So there's some potential good applications. There's also, because there are such large economies of scale in, in all aspects of data, in, in its collection, its management, it gives the natural advantages to big industries and, and vertically and the vertical integration of those industri industries. And we're really seeing that in the agricultural sector uh, where big data, uh, there still are examples of kind of startup big data companies, but there is this alarming concentration of data into uh, companies which are integrated across equipment, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, and now data is that they're adding to their to their business models. And so that uh, ever uh, advancing concentration is very important. And as Gordon, Gordon said, in the Canadian context, it's, you really can't talk about forest data or, or natural resource data or even health data without thinking about the processes of, of decolonization uh, and reconciliation that we, we're, we're trying to move up toward. So, uh, and uh, indigenous data sovereignty and indigenous data governance are very important topics for indigenous institutions and uh, the decolonization process. Are, are some interesting movements in that area. Uh, for example, indigenous organizations, scholar, scholars developing new awareness of uh, sovereignty in the health sector, and some interesting examples in the health sector um, of uh, principles of ownership, control, access, and possession of health data being managed between uh, indigenous groups and indigenous health authorities and other public health authorities and finding ways to 
respect the need for alternative health approaches to to be effective with indigenous populations uh, at the same time as respecting privacy concerns. So there are some in the health areas. I think there are some uh, some glimmers of of ways forward in the agriculture areas. Is I I would think we would try to avoid some of the the concentration um, that we've seen in that sector. So that was, that was sort of my quick comments on sort of big picture issues. Uh, I'd like to um, note you know, all of the many important con contributions that are um, the commenters have made and and wish that I could continue this work with my colleagues in Finland. And I'll just do a wrap, uh, just a final note, thanking the Academy of Finland and the University of Alberta who provided uh, funding for this work that allowed our collaboration. Uh, I'd like to thank the team members that, that I've been able to interact with, people who've contributed to um, the work here, and particularly the team at the Finnish Environment Institute. Um, thank our advisors, Gordon Gao and Tapu Kujala uh, at the University of Finland, sorry, Eastern Finland, and all those who provided the information through interviews and workshops uh, and those who attended today. So with that, I'll pass back to Rika. Thank you. Thank you for all these concluding remarks and for this acknowledging our collaborators in Finland and Canada and our visitors here or people who joined us to webinar. I was reading these comments once more here. Anu, would you like to have something you have been writing here a couple of times in the chat? Do, would you like to continue still here or are there any, anything to add? Please, Anu. I just wrote that the part participatory rights are also important rights in a democracy and participation on, on decision making processes and, and being acknowledged as a, and recognized as an actor to be heard and to have an impact in both planning the data uh, procedures and procedures and uh, data systems and for governing the forests. So both systems require participation and participatory rights and recognition. Just my comment there. Yes, really. Good. And do you Brent have here? Uh, Deb has been also commenting here uh, about this opening data. And this is uh, to comment that it's not only open access and exactly. That's uh, that's about open participation in designing and negotiating the rules for collecting data, sharing and opening it and using it for innovations. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And we have been recording this webinar and we will share or uh, edit this a little bit before sharing, we try to get your names away from the recordings and make it, it as anonymous as possible. Mm, but then we will share it on the website of the project. You will find our, our publications and other writings there in, in addition to the video that we will make today. Thank you, everyone. Have, have, have a nice evening or day here in Canada and here in Finland. Thank you for joining today. Bye-bye.